Good morning. morning. It's good to see each one of you with us today. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know that you are our honored guest. Um, We are in the midst of a a series we're calling Churches in the Shape of Scripture. Um, This series is born out of a deep respect uh, for the Word of God. We think it is literally His Word. Every word is important. Every word is breathed out by Him. And so I need to pay attention to every word. He literally means what He says. Uh, And so when I approach the Bible to learn how I ought to live, how I ought to worship, how I ought to be saved, I need to take Him at face value. And so that's what we're trying to do in this series is just go through the Bible and very simply look at what He said how we should shape the churches that we're a part of. And if we find some things that are amiss, we need to make some changes. And so today we're talking about, uh, kind of uh, entitled this, this lesson, Where's the Band? Because one of the first things you, you might notice as you walk into our congregation is there's, there's no instruments on the stage, right? If you didn't grow up uh, in, in this congregation, maybe that's the first thing you noticed when you stepped foot in here Kind of where they're where they're keeping the you know the guitar and the, the piano and so where where is that? Well, this lesson's going to talk a little bit about why we don't worship that way. And I don't think you find those things in scripture. But before we get to scripture, I wanted to walk you through a Cliff Notes version of history of of instrumental music in churches. Um, James McKinnon, he's a he's a church historian. You're going to hear his name a couple times during this lesson, but watch. Uh, for the credentials of a lot of these people. These guys are are all church historians, professors, seminary professors. Uh, So these guys have the credentials. They know what they're talking about. It's just not somebody talking off the street. And none of these guys are members of the Church of Christ. Not a single one of them. So listen to what they say first, and then we're going to talk about what the Bible says about instruments in in, uh, worship. James McKenna says this, The antagonism which the fathers of the early church displayed toward instruments has two outstanding characteristics, vehemence and uniformity. Now, we're going to talk about the underlined words uh, in just a second, but I want you to to realize who he's talking about here. Who are the early church fathers? Well, there are some early theologians um, that uh, pop up right after the apostles start dying. In fact, um, Polycarp was one of the very earliest church fathers, and he was a disciple of the Apostle John. So that's how very close we're talking to the to the apostolic age, how close we're talking to the apostles here. Very, very, very close. These Many of these men knew the apostles, or they lived in the church very early on. We're talking from maybe 100 A.D. to about 600 A.D. So very early on, a group of theologians... Uh, that, that spoke uh, about various church matters. That's what these guys, that's who we're talking about here when we say the early church fathers. Uh, these guys didn't really have a role, but they were theologians who were in the church early on uh, in, in the early years, the early uh, centuries of the church's development. And so, again, they're not inspired. These are just men, just like you and I. Um, but when they speak on a subject and they all agree that's something we ought to stop and think about. Um, you're going to find, if you do your research on these guys, uh, some of them believe, um, for example, you know, this, this, this one particular thing, and this other guy over here is going to say something completely different, and they're going to be at odds. Uh, but when they speak on the same issue in the same way, that's something we should pay attention to. And that's what this guy, just this James McKinnon, uh, church, histori- church historian, says, he says, they have some antagonism. Uh, And so when he says antagonism, uh, he's talking about this instruments in worship were opposed by the church fathers. They didn't like them. Uh, They didn't worship with the instrument. For the first 600 years, they didn't worship with the instrument. But put put a pin in that thought, and we're going to move that pin on down the line as we progress forward today. But he says they opposed it, antagonism. Um, and then he says they, they all thought about it in these two ways. They vehemently opposed instruments in worship. 
It wasn't like they were sitting on the fence. It wasn't like they were, yeah, we could take it or leave it. It's not a big deal. They all opposed it rigorously. Rigorously? I'm having trouble with words today. You guys forgive me. Um, they all opposed it stringently. How about that? Um, and then he says the uniformity with which they opposed it. It wasn't just like some of them opposed it rigorously, but they all opposed it stringently. So that's interesting. Uh, we've got several quotes from these guys, uh, so just kind of bear with me here as we walk through these, but I think it's important to show you the history of how long instruments did not make their way into the church. Because we know the first century church didn't worship with the instruments. That's 100% clear. Everybody agrees with that. And throughout the rest of this, uh, this section, as we talk about what the church fathers believe, you're going to find out for the next several centuries, nobody worshiped with the instrument. So listen in as this guy. His name's Robert Godfrey. Uh, again, he's got the credentials to talk about this. He says, in the worship of the church, it appears that for almost the first thousand years of its history, no instruments were used in Christian worship. He's right, but he's not all the way right. So he didn't go far enough out. Uh, the instrument didn't actually start making its way into churches until the early 1300s. Let me back that up for you. About the time of Thomas Aquinas, you guys might remember him. He's, he's kind of the most famous of the Roman Catholic theologians. Even today, he's kind of the, the, the guy that they go back to when they, when they want to know um, a point of theology. The, about his time is when the instrument started making its way into some of the churches. When I say churches, I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church in this instance because they are the rule in the, uh, in the Middle Ages uh, during this time period. Uh, so when we say churches here, that's what they're talking about. It's not the Church of Christ. It's, he's, he's talking about the, the Roman Catholic Church. So anyhow, listen to what these two guys say. Joseph Bingham says, Music in churches is as ancient as the apostles, but instrumental music not so. For it is now generally agreed among learned men that the use of organs came into the church since the time of Thomas Aquinas in 1250. McClintock and Strong, they, you might have their, uh, their concordance, the Strong's concordance. That's these guys. Uh, and so this is what they say. Students of ecclesiastical archaeology, that's a fun term, isn't it? Ecclesiastical archaeology are generally agreed that instrumental music was not used in churches till a much later date for Thomas Aquinas, A.D. 1250, has these remarkable words. Our church does not use mus musical instruments as harps and psalteries to praise God. From this passage, we are surely warranted in concluding that there was no ecclesiastical use of, or, 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 of organs in the time of Aquinas. Let me take you to what Aquinas actually said. The church does not use musical instruments since the harp, such as the harp or lyre when praising God in case she should seem to fall back into Judaism. For musical instruments usually move the soul more to pleasure than create inner moral goodness. That's kind of what he was concerned about. Um, he said... These, these the musical instruments have, have a place, you know, they can, they can move the soul. But he says, they don't, they don't move you to inner moral goodness. You ever stopped and thought about why we sing? And the one that the passage Trevor read for you today from Ephesians 5, I hope, I'm hoping we'll get back to it again at the end of our lesson today. But he says, yeah, you're to speak to one another admonishing one another, teaching one another, encouraging one another. There's a reason why we sing. But it's, there's also this, this aspect of that Aquinas draws out of uh, the inner moral goodness, uh, the, 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 the propelling forward of our hearts, uh, the, the encouragement that we gain from singing. He says instruments don't have that ability. That's his reason for not allowing them in the churches uh, before now. Does it matter his reason? Not really. What I want you to see is they weren't there all the way for 1,250 years since the apostles, since Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, there were no musical instruments in any church all the way through 1250. Now, I say any church. There were your random exceptions, uh, but the norm was that there were no musical instruments in the churches all the way up until this time. Now, about 1300, 1300 to 1500, things are going to start changing. And 
uh, by the 1500s, it's kind of the, the norm in the Roman Catholic Church. Again, that's what we're talking about when we say church in this lesson, uh, for this section at least. So in the Roman Catholic Church during the 1500s, it was the norm for there to be an organ or a piano in uh, some of the, the Roman Catholic churches. Now, when the Reformers came into play, they started changing everything. Um, last week, we talked a little bit about Luther and Calvin and a guy named Zwingli uh, in our baptism lesson. Calvin and Zwingli come into play in this lesson as well. Zwingli, you remember, had, had these, this view of baptism, and he kind of he went astray from Scripture again um, there. But uh, he's going to come back a little bit in this lesson. But again, our, our goal is to restore the church, uh, the model for the church that Jesus set out in the New Testament. And so that's what we're trying to get back to. Um, Zwingli started um, preaching, I think, in 1529 um, in the, the Great Minister Church. That's what it's called in England. And uh, he, he dismantled the organ that was in that congregation, that was in that church building. He had it dismantled. And for the next 300 years, it's going to remain in pieces somewhere in a back storage room because that's how he felt about instruments. They don't belong in worship. His successor, a guy you're probably familiar with, named John Calvin, has this to say. I have no doubt that playing upon cymbals, touching the harp and the viol and, the, and all that kind of music, which is so frequently mentioned in the Psalms, was part of the service of the temple. But when they, the Christians, frequent, frequent their sacred assemblies, musical instruments and celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting of lamps, or, and the restoration of the other shadows of the law, the law of Moses. The Papists, as the Catholics, therefore have foolishly borrowed this as well as many other things from the Jews. Men who are fond of outward pomp may delight in that noise, but the simplicity which God recommends to us by the apostles is far more pleasing. Now, again, you find a lot of Calvin's uh, ideology sneaking in here. You find out why he disagrees with the instrument. He thinks it meant uh, that they were going back into Judaism. There's something to be said there, because obviously you find in instruments in, in the temple worship. Uh, but does his reasoning matter? No, not really. All I want to show you is there's this 200-year span here from 1300 to about 1500 where instruments were in the Catholic Church. And then these guys come in, the reformers came in, and they started taking them out again because they went back to the Bible and they saw the model. And they said, this isn't right. This isn't, this isn't how the first century church worshipped. I'm going to tell you why, how they came to that conclusion in just a second. But I've got a few more quotes I want to share with you. Calvin uh, continued, To sing the praises of God upon the harp and psaltery unquestionably formed part of the training of the law, the law of Moses, and of the service of God under the dispensation of shadows and figures, the Old Testament period. But they are not now to be used in public thanksgiving. We are not indeed forbidden to use in private musical instruments, but they are banished out of the churches by the plain command of the Holy Spirit when Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 13 lays it down as an invariable rule that we must praise God and now and, and to pray to him only in a known tongue. So he makes a really interesting argument there that we don't really have time to deal with today. But again, his reasoning doesn't so much matter as he's gone back to Scripture and saw... They didn't use them in the first century. And so he's pulling them out of, uh, out of the Roman Catholic churches. And, and all the reformers did. Let me give you um, this quote from them. This is a guy by name John Price. He's a Southern Baptist minister in the 19th century who's a, uh, a church historian. He's got an interesting story. Um, the, the, the Baptist churches in his area started doing this um, survey uh, of you know how, what instruments can you bring in because in in his day uh, the, this particular subset of the Baptist Church would only allow one instrument in and so this survey went around and said well how many instruments should we let in can can we do two can we do five can we do ten should we do just one and so they sent out the survey and people filled in and he got a hold of it and he started reading through it and he started he went back to the Bible and he he got up one Sunday morning to his congregation and said we've been we've been doing wrong um, and so. Uh, in the 19th century, this Baptist church, he said, we're going to delete all of the instruments. We shouldn't just be worshiping with one. We shouldn't worship. We shouldn't add more to it. We should, we should go back to none. Uh, but this is what he says in his book. 
talking about the reformers, he said, they would take no rest until instruments were removed. By the late 1500s, again, from 1300 to, to the 1500s, they were pretty pervasive instruments in, in worship work. He says, by the late 1500s, this corruption of church worship, which had crept in during the Dark Ages, 1300s, had been, effective, had been effectively banished from the Reformed churches. So he says the Catholic Church can do whatever they want to, but these guys that were, were attempting to reform the church, he says, it had been completely gone. These guys went back to the Bible and said, how did the first century church worship? How did God want them to worship? They went back and they found out that they didn't have the authority to worship with the instruments, so they banished it from their reformed churches. The greatest spiritual revival since the days of the apostles had returned the church to the apostolic simplicity of unaccompanied congregational singing. There's a couple more as we get closer to our own time period. Around the 1600s, uh, there's this group called the Puritans. We're familiar with them because of the Mayflower and all that kind of stuff and, you know, up north. Anyhow, um, in England and in America, this is how they felt about instruments in worship. The Puritans welcomed instrumental music into their homes while refusing its assist assistance in their meeting houses. So they didn't use it uh, to worship. This restriction is based in part on the demand for simplicity and sincerity in worship, but also on their interpretation of Scripture and the, fi and the finality of the authority of the New Testament for them. So he goes on to say, it was not that they disliked music, but that they loved the true religion of Christ's ordinances more. Today we might say, it's not like we don't like instruments, it's that we respect the Word of God more than we love instruments. So, that's kind of how the Puritans felt about it. But let, me, let me continue. Uh, on up until the late 1800s, uh, what the Reformers started in the 1500s by wiping the instrument out is still continuing on, uh, even in the 1800s. Now, the instrument started creeping back, um, but there's some guys in the late 1800s that I want, to hear, I want you to hear what they have to say. He says, this guy, John Spencer Kerwin, he's a, a president of, of a music school, uh, in the 1800s, he says, Men still living can remember the time when organs were very seldom found outside the Church of England. The Methodists, Independents, and Baptists rarely had them, and, the and by the Presbyterians, they were stoutly opposed. So even as late as the 18, late 1800s, he says, There's some old guys here today that can remember back in the day when no instruments were anywhere in any of the churches. Um, this guy says, uh, David Benedict, says, the changes which have been experienced in the feelings of a large portion of our people has often surprised me. Staunch old Baptists in former times would as, would as has soon tolerated the Pope of Rome in their pulpits as an organ in their galleries. And yet the instrument has gradually found its way among them. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon says. You're probably familiar with Spurgeon. He's a famous Baptist preacher living in the 1800s, died in 1894. This is what he said about the instrument. Um, and interestingly enough, John uh, MacArthur is a Baptist preacher today. Uh, you probably heard of him. He's written several uh, books. But uh, he says that about, about Spurgeon, he wouldn't like the organ that's in our church. So that's kind of interesting. This is what church, Charles Spurgeon said in his commentary on the Psalms. David appears to have had a, a, peculiar, a peculiarly tender remembrance of the singing of the pilgrims, and assuredly it is the most delightful part of worship and that which comes nearest to the adoration of heaven. What a degradation to supplant the intelligent song of the whole congregation by the theatrical prettiness of a quartet, the refined niceties of a choir, or the blowing off of wind from inanimate bellows and pipes. We might as well pray by machinery as praise by it. He's got a cute turn of phrase there, doesn't he? But he's right. Uh, we might as well pray by machinery. You would never think of uh, walking over to, uh, to, an, uh, to a piano and, and tapping out chords and, and thinking that, that was praying, would we? He says, you might as well do that as praise by it. And so, um, why did, for the first 1,800 years of Christianity, these guys not worship with the instrument? What did they find that we need to see? Is basically what I'm asking. Because the Reformers, the Puritans, uh, Charles Spurgeon, these guys, they had gone back to the Bible and they had looked for how we ought to worship. What did they find that we need to see? What did they find that we need to understand? We've got some tour guides that are going to help us in this last part uh, of our lesson this morning. The first one's Moses. Moses. 
And so what did Moses say? Well, in Numbers 10, uh, the first couple of verses there, God gives Moses some commands. Moses is going to be the guy that sets up tabernacle worship. All this happens on Mount Sinai. Uh, and so at, after the Exodus, the very first place the Israelites go is Mount Sinai. It takes them 11 days to travel there. They get to the base of the mountain. Moses goes up. For 40 days, he's up there. He gets the law, the Ten Commandments and the law. He comes back down, children of Israel worshiping. You remember the golden calf? All this kind of stuff. And it, it, it all breaks down from there. But God had given Moses the Ten Commandments uh, and the law. And one of the things he said to him, uh, as Moses looks back in Numbers on that incident, is this. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets of hammered work. You shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for breaking camp. On the day of your gladness also, this is verse 10, and at your appointed feasts, when else should you use the instrument? Basically is what he's, he's getting at here. And at your appointed feast and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over, your sacrifice, and over the sacrifices of your peace offering. They shall be a reminder of you before your God. I am the Lord your God. And so why did Moses worship like that? Why did Moses bring in these two trumpets? Was it because he liked the trumpets? No. Was it because he, was a, he, he found some guys in Israel that were good trumpeteers? No. It's because God told him exactly what he wanted out of them as far as worship goes in this respect. And so when God said it, Moses made these two silver trumpets and he did exactly um, what God told him to do in this respect. So after Moses dies and the tabernacle worship continues for several hundred years, all the way up until the time of David. And the great King David is the one that instituted temple worship. At least he tried to. He wanted to. He had the heart to. But do you remember, God's not going to allow him to build the temple. He passes that responsibility on to David's son, Solomon. He's going to be the one that eventually builds the temple. But David had it all planned out. In fact, he had it all planned out to the extent of worship, how it works. He hadn't just been... Uh, preparing the, 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 the stuff, the gold and the wood and all that stuff. He'd been laying all that stuff aside as well. Um, but he had also been thinking about the worship. And I want you to remember that little tidbit. He had been thinking about how to worship. Second Chronicles chapter 16 talks about that. And we're going to follow this train of thought for just a second. Then, the, then he appointed, David, then he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief, and second to him were, uh, were Zechariah, Jeel, Shemirath, Jehel, Mataniah, Eliab, Beniah, Obed, Edom, and Jerel, who were to play the harps and lyres. Asaph was to play the, was to play the cymbals, and Benaniah and Yahazel, the priests, were to blow the trumpets regularly before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Now, why did he change? I know that's a lot of funny names, right? But why did he change? Because back in the tabernacle worship, it was just two silver trumpets, and God said, this is how you should blow them, and this is when you should blow them, this is who should blow them. David starts adding in all these instruments, right? He, he starts putting in all these, these different things, and so why? How? Well, let's go find out. When David was old and full of days, he made Solomon his son king over Israel. David assembled all the leaders of Israel and the priests and the Levites. The Levites were 30 years old and upward were numbered, and the total was 38,000 men. 24,000 of these, David said, shall have charge of the work in the house of the Lord. Uh, 6,000 shall be officers, officers and judges, 4,000 gatekeepers, and 4,000 shall offer praises to the Lord with, with the instruments that I have made for praise. Interesting, right? Hold on to that tidbit. Let's go to the next one. Why did David add in all these instruments? God told him to. Uh, and he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres according to the commandments of David and of, Gad, and of Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan the prophet, for the commandment was from the Lord through the prophets. So it wasn't like David, you know, David was an accomplished harp player, right? So it wasn't like he looked at uh, the worship of the Lord, and they were doing the two trumpets. He's like, I'm not really good at the trumpet, um, so uh, let's bring in a harp so, so I can help, you know, because that's my talent. That's what I like. Hey, that's not what he did. He brought in extra instruments and changed the way that they worship. Why? Because God told him to. It's authority. It's an issue of authority. 
So we worship the way God tells us to worship because he has the authority to line all that stuff up, to outline how that should function. First Chronicles chapter 32. <laughs> uh, then David gave Solomon, his son, the plan of the vestibule of the temple and, its, and of its houses, its treasuries, its upper rooms, and its inner chambers, and of the rooms for the mercy seat, with the plan of all that he had in mind for the courts of the houses for the Lord, all the surrounding chambers, the treasuries of the house of God, and the treasuries for dedicated gifts, for the divisions of the priests and of the Levites, and all the work of the service of the house of the Lord, for all the vessels of the, for the service in the house of the Lord. And all this he made. Clear to me in writing from the hand of the Lord all the work to be done according to the plan. David says there's a plan. God had a plan. And so that's why David changed it from the way that Moses was doing it, right? Later, David, uh, excuse me, after, David, after Solomon builds the temple, uh, things are going to go okay during Solomon's lifetime. Rehoboam is going to take over and things are going to kind of go to pot again. Uh, and eventually... 300 years later, by the time Hezekiah, David's great, 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 great grandson, sits on the throne, temple worship has gone astray, and Hezekiah is looking to uh, reinstitute all the things, to do, to do things God's way. So he goes back and he finds his scrolls. And this is what he says. And he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres, according to the commandment of David and of Gad the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet, for the commandment was from the Lord through the prophets. Hezekiah went back and found what David said when he was looking to restore temple worship after so after 300 years of not having temple worship. He says, well, what do we do? Do we look around and we assess our skill sets and the things that the people like? And like, oh, Joe over there likes, likes you know, he likes the banjo, and so we should bring that up. And is that what they did? I'm not trying to make light, but is that what they did? It's not, is it? When they wanted to know what God had to say when they tried to go back to temple worship the way it, had, it should have been, where did they go? They didn't go to what they thought was best or what they liked best. They went back to the Bible. Uh, and so that's what Hezekiah does here. Hezekiah is not the only one, though, um, because fast forward about 200 more years, and it's happened all over again. Temple worship has gone astray again. This is after the Babylonian exile. The temple is gone, and they're trying to rebuild it um, and this happens in Ezra chapter 3, uh, verse 10. It says, And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their, in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord according to what? The directions of David, king of Israel. Now, where did David get those directions? From God. Uh, Nehemiah does the exact same thing uh, when he's trying to restore temple worship in his day just 50 years later. So now we're about 550 years since David has died. Listen to what they do. And the, chief, and the chiefs of the Levites, uh, these guys, I don't want to read any more names, with their brothers who stood opposite them to praise and to give thanks according to the commandment of David, the man of God, watch by watch. So when he was trying to restore the temple worship, where did he go? He went back to what God had told David because he hadn't changed his mind since then. He changed his mind with David when they brought in... Uh, when they brought in the temple, when things changed and they, and they started worshiping in the temple as opposed to the tabernacle, God told David what to do, how to worship, what, what, what had to change. But things haven't changed from David all the way to Nehemiah. And so when Nehemiah starts trying to restore temple worship, what did he do? He went all the way back to David. Verse 35, And certain of the priests' sons with trumpets, with the trumpets, Zechariah, the son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, son of Mataniah, son of Micah, Son of Zakur, son of Asaph, and his relatives, those guys, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God, and Ezra the scribe went before them. Uh, and they performed the service of their God and the service of purification, as did the singers and the gatekeepers, according to the commandment of David and his son Solomon. Where did they get the commandment? Well, they got it from God. My point with all this is, and the repetition is to show you, when they wanted to restore temple worship, when they wanted to figure out how to worship, they went all the way back to David, to the last word of God. They went back to him to figure out what was necessary. So today, where are we going to go? Do we go back to David? He's spoken since then, right? Um, at the cross, the old law was nailed there, and it's done away with. And so who do we look to now? Well, we look to the apostles, right? Right? 
Uh, and that's, that's a pretty common thought in the New Testament. Certainly Acts 2, verse 42 might be a good uh, place to start. He says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. What did they devote themselves to? The apostles' teaching. That's where we get our word from the Lord, from the apostles. They're the ones that dispense um, his knowledge now. And certainly they have complete control over the church and the way that we should go. 1 Corinthians 14 is just one instance of that. Uh, during a time when the Corinthian church thought that they could do whatever they wanted to do with the Lord's Supper, listen to what Paul says. If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. And so when the Corinthian church was going against what Paul said, Paul said, if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, you're not going to be recognized because I'm telling you the commands of God. And so we go back to the apostles. When we start looking to restore worship, to do it God's way, where do we go? We don't go back to David. We don't go back to Moses. We go back to the apostles and we look for what they said. Just like Nehemiah looked back at David, just like Ezra, just like Hezekiah looked back at what David said, we looked to what the apostles said. And so what did the apostles tell us to use? What kind of instruments did the apostles tell us to use? There's none. In the New Testament, they don't talk about instruments at all. Uh, Eflagard Smith says this. He says, In contrast to the many Old Testament passages referring to musical instruments in temple worship in the New Testament, in the New Testament text, not one sound of a musical instrument is heard. Not a trumpet, not a harp, not the quietest jingle of a tambourine. Singing, yes. Musical instruments, no. Relative to musical instruments, there's only an ominous, haunting silence. And so we're making an argument Almost from silence, uh, if, you've, if you've heard that, uh, that thought before. Uh, that, that's kind of what this argument is coming from, but it's, it's very, very strong. So when God told Moses how to worship in the tabernacle, did it matter? Did it matter what Moses did? Could he have made three trumpets? Could he have made... Two golden trumpets? Wouldn't have gold been more uh, honorific toward God? Would that have been pleasing? We obey, you know? That, that's, our, that's our job. And so when God told Moses to build two silver trumpets to worship at this time, that's exactly what Moses did. Years later, when he tells David to worship and, uh, to add these other instruments into the worship service and do, to do it like this, what's David do? He does exactly what God commands. And so when we move to the New Testament, you expect to, to hear the exact same thing because the last two times, every time in fact, there's only two, he changes the way his people should worship. Who's in charge of adding stuff? Is it the guy that comes up with it, like David or Moses? Nope. The only one that's in charge of changing the worship, adding instruments or taking them away or appointing new times to add, or new ways to add them. Who, who does that? Well, it's only God. And so when you come to the New Testament, you expect to find the exact same thing, don't you? You expect Him to say, this is how we're going to worship. This is, this is, these are the instruments that you should use. I don't have it on the slide, but turn over to, uh, to Ephesians 5, the verse Trevor read for us this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, verses, uh, verses 18 through 20. We're going to start in verse 19 for time's sake. Uh, he says, Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And so this word he uses for singing, uh, excuse me, for making melody is this Greek word solo. And it means to pluck a string like you, like you would a harp. But he doesn't say harp here, right? He's so precise in the Old Testament, with David, with Moses. We move to the New Testament, he's going to be just as precise. And so he says, sing and make melody to the Lord with your plucker string. What? What instrument? 
your heart. He's precise in the Old Testament with how he deals with worship. Do this in this way. When we move to the New Testament, he's, going, he's just as precise. He just leaves out the instrument. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why he started with two trumpets with Moses and then added more with David. I, I don't get that. I don't, I don't understand it. It doesn't really matter. When we move to the New Testament, he's just as precise. How do you worship? Well, you go back to the apostles to figure that out, right? They told us. And here in Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, Paul tells us, well, you worship with your heart. You sing and make melody as you pluck the, the strings in your heart. It's, it's an emotion. It's an emotional worship. Uh, and so our minds should be focused, but it should also, also stir our hearts as we worship. And so the instrument that we pluck or string today isn't a harp or a guitar. It's our heart. It's very precise. And so um, today maybe, maybe this lesson hasn't been evangelistic, but maybe, maybe you've been thinking about some things that uh, you need to change in your own life, or maybe you've even been thinking about baptism. Uh, if you have any need this morning, why don't you come today as we stand and sing?